Hello and shalom, everybody. My name is Julia Jassy, and you are listening to Nice Jewish Girls, brought to you by Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Before we get started, if you haven't already, take a moment right now and subscribe to this pod. You will not regret it, I promise. On today's episode, we are sitting down with Dr. Erica Brown, an educator, an interviewer, and a Jewish leader. It's such an honor to talk with Erica today, and honestly, more than a little bit intimidating. When we are talking about walking in the footsteps of some of the greatest women in the Jewish community on this podcast, we are quite literally referring to women like Dr. Brown. Interviewing her today is such a full circle moment. She has interviewed some of the most important people in the Jewish community throughout her career. We're talking Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, New York Times columnist David Brooks, editor-in-chief of The Atlantic Jeffrey Goldberg, esteemed Holocaust historian and State Department anti-Semitism envoy Deborah Lipstadt, and of course, former presidential speechwriter and most importantly, former guest on Nice Jewish Girls, Sarah Hurwitz. I'm so moved by Dr. Erica Brown's commitment to the preservation of Jewish history. There's something I find so powerful about stories. In so many ways, sharing them is the root of this podcast. And this is something that I want to talk to her about today. Why record the history of these important Jewish people as a passion project, especially when she's doing so much incredible work herself? What makes her interview special? Because boy, they sure do feel that way. I am so excited for you guys to meet Dr. Erica Brown today. Let's do this thing. Dr. Erica Brown is the director of the Mayberg Center for Jewish Education and Leadership and an associate professor of curriculum and pedagogy at the George Washington University. She's the author of 12 books on leadership, the Hebrew Bible, and spirituality. Erica has a daily podcast, Take Your Soul to Work. She has been published basically everywhere, including the New York Times, The Atlantic, Tablet, First Things, The Jewish Review of Books, and The New York Jewish Week. She currently serves as a community scholar for the congregation at Time in Livingston, New Jersey. Erica, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for coming today. It's wonderful to be here. It's a real delight to talk to you, Julia. I want to really start off in the beginning. So you grew up as a, as a Jewish woman. What was your experience like in your relationship to Judaism when you were younger? So that's a great question and a complicated question, which always makes it more interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up, uh, my uh, mother is a child survivor of the Holocaust, mm-hmm. and my grandparents were Auschwitz survivors. They, um, they were each liberated one day apart, one by the British and one by the Americans, uh, and they didn't find each other and my mother for a whole year. Wow. So they were apart for a long time. And uh, they went back to Germany, then they went to, uh, then they came to America. So the story of Judaism for me was a really Holocaust saturated story. My grandparents were Gera Hasidim when they lived in Poland, but they let go of religion when they came to Jackson, New Jersey, where they had a chicken farm, as did um, many other Mm. survivors who came and tried to rebuild a life. And I would say that um, when you grow up, as as I imagine some of your listeners um, have experienced personally, when you grow up in a home of survivors, that is the Jewish story. That is the narrative. But that narrative comes with a lot of other consequences, um, you know, it, and I mean quite literally because it's a very depressing story and mm-hmm. it's a story of being hated and it's a story of being small and insignificant and, uh, and powerless. And I think I was looking for another master narrative about Judaism. I, I went to a Hebrew school, not a particularly good Hebrew school, mm-hmm. but I did win a junior Jewish encyclopedia for saying the first paragraph of Shema quicker than anyone else. Um, (laughs) And um, (laughs) from which I learned that you should say all Jewish prayers very, very quickly, and then you'll be rewarded. I agree. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, yeah, why not? Um, So I I did have a sense that that was an environment, Hebrew school is an environment which I was successful in. I was a student, but I was a nerdy student, and I got picked on quite a bit. Yet a friend of mine in Hebrew school, who actually lives in my community right now, invited me to a Shabbaton, uh, an NCSY Shabbaton 
That's the um, National Council of Synagogue Youth. I had no idea what a Shabbaton was. I really didn't know anything about these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I went and I saw people singing with joy and dancing and living a sort of different life than I lived. And I was intrigued by it and I was excited. Um, It took a long time. It took a lot of years of my journey to actual commitment. But I think it's it started there. It's really started. I mean, it, it's shown me throughout my life the power of invitation and what an invitation can do to a life. That's a really interesting story. Um, it reminds me of something that we talked about on a previous podcast. Um, the idea of like generationally there being a shift in the way that we respond to trauma happening in our community. And so mm. one thing we talk about in some of the Jewish studies classes that I've been taking recently um, is like this idea of there being this change over three generations um, and the first generation of tragedy happens and then it takes two to kind of recover from it. But then you want to recover and come back into this culture that you kind of had taken from you when that tragedy happened and they wanted to be that separation. So I think that your story really does embody that. And I think a lot of the people we're talking to on this podcast, myself included, have had that experience in their lives. And so what I'm really curious about is now you're a mother, you're a grandmother, and you're raising this new generation of people who are going to connect to Judaism in their own way. How has your perspective on this culture shifted now that you have that particular experience? Yeah, it's a, it's an excellent question and a fantastic framing. I um, There's a, an Israeli whose first name escapes me, Zerubavel, who has done research on the impact of stories on, mm-hmm. on identity. And so he says, you know, many people tell a story of ascendancy, right? We were wonderful. Our family was so prominent. And then everything began to fall apart. And then there's ascending narratives, which is we came from suffering like the Holocaust. You know, we were, some wanted to kill us, but we overcame and we rebuilt our family. And Zubavel contends that the best sort of story to tell is an oscillating narrative, right? We faced adversity, we overcame it. Um, Those are the sort of the healthiest narratives. And I would say, as a mother and grandmother, that story, that oscillating narrative has been very important. Um, my, it's important that my children know where they came from. I had the great, great good fortune of having my grandfather live till he was 95 and my grandmother lived to 100. Wow. So they were married for 72 years. And so they really wow. built decades of life after the Shoah, after the Holocaust. And they were a powerful force for good. And my children had great grandparents, which meant they were really directly connected to the sadness of their story. But also my grandparents were very, very funny people. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, my grandfather always told the same bad jokes, but he, but he was, they were people who, who did love life and they took great, great joy in things. And so in terms of saying you can tell a, a dark story, but you have to have lots of light in that story. And for me, balancing out with saying Jewish ritual and Jewish law. Uh, you know, I, uh, we raised our children as Orthodox Jews. Our lives are highly mm-hmm. ritualized. Um, and yet there, the importance, you know, it, it, they, they also have to be infused with joy. All those rituals have to be joyous. If they're not, they're onerous and people don't want to take them on. And, um, I would say when my oldest had her first child, a son, and we were all together for Shabbat, that first Shabbat, and my husband made Kiddush, you know, we all started to cry. And I think it was a very, very powerful moment in a family is not so much having my own children, but seeing that Jewish continuity is really about having grandchildren and being able to share mm-hmm. that language so that it's not only, you know, one generation making Kiddush and another generation saying Amen. It's everybody really being at the table and having that shared language of ritual, of prayer, um, and happiness. Yeah, I think that's a really impactful way of viewing it. And that's been something that I've been trying to shift in my perspective. Um, Over the past year, I think a lot of my work has been on anti-Semitism. And I was talking to my rabbi almost a year ago about it because it kind of gets you down after a while. Um, Yeah. And yeah, and I remember telling them that it was it, it was a hard thing that I was struggling with. And they, they said, you know, you can view it as Jewish history, as this continued cycle of oppression, of they hate us, they exile us, they kill us. Or you can view it as this continued cycle of resilience in spite of oppression, of exactly. continuing to survive even though they've hated us, they've tried to kill us. 
And I think that idea of an oscillating narrative that, yes, this bad experience exists, but we've survived in spite of it, um, is a really important framing. And I think a lot of the way that Jewish stories are being told now. Yeah, I I actually worry a little bit uh, because I think anti Jews respond to sort of urgency and emergency. And so mm -hmm. we tell Holocaust stories. We tell anti-Semitism stories because they help us fund campaigns and they get people, you know, they, mm -hmm. they build solidarity. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, I, my master narrative is not the Holocaust. It's really the Exodus narrative, right? It's about being mm -hmm. saved and then, and then shedding that light to other dark spaces because I can live in the light. And I actually am very, very concerned that the American Jewish narrative has become densely depressing. Um, you know, it, you go to any synagogue, uh, cities across America have Holocaust memorials. They don't have mm -hmm. celebrations of Jewish life in the public square in the same way. And so I, I, I think it's it's deeply concerning and, and something I guess I devote my professional life to is trying to say, how do you have a different narrative? How do you create and how do you uphold a different narrative and not the immediate, urgent, everyone hates us narrative? It's not healthy. And you've done a lot of work on sharing a more positive narrative. And one thing you mentioned earlier on in the interview was the power that you find in stories. So a big part of your work has been moderating panels, conducting interviews with lots of really incredible people. Um, Madeline Albright, actually, Sarah Hurwitz was a, a previous guest on our, mm -hmm. our podcast, so it's a name that hits close to home. Deborah Lipstadt, these really incredible people. In what capacity are these interviews happening um, that's kind of to start off from what capacity it is interviews happening. Well, sometimes I, I'm asked by other organizations who have, you know, sort of a, a, a star mm -hmm. and they want someone to interview them and give some Jewish context to the conversation. Very often through my own Mayberg Center, uh, certainly during COVID, we were able to conduct a lot of interviews um, uh, virtually and anyone's welcome to go on our website and uh, listen to them and join us on future interviews. So um, Julia, when I was employed in the Federation, I used to write speeches for people, mm -hmm. um, which is natural. I'm a speaker and I'm a writer. And uh, writing speeches for other people was a real Martin Buber experience of I and thou, mm -hmm. because you need to capture their voice. It can't be your voice. If it's, if it's your words and your voice, it's just never going to sound authentic to them. And I find the speech writing process really, really interesting. It's interesting that you had Sarah, yeah. uh, who's a friend who was writing, uh, you know, speeches for Michelle Obama and sometimes for, for President Obama. Um, you know, there's a, there's a process by which you actually really squash your own ego in order to really create a platform for someone else's voice. And that I think is the key to a good interview. I'll hear interviewers who just, they're interviewing someone else so that they can have the laugh or they can make the comment or they can give their ideas over. I think a lot of comedians who do that uh, and mm -hmm. people enjoy that because they, 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 they come for the laugh. And so the laugh at someone else's expense is fine. I, I'm a very curious person. I really love to hear other people's stories. So to me, to just be able to be with someone in a, in that kind of space in that kind of public space and get a sense of, what drives them and how they, what they, what impact they're having and, um, and what disturbs them and what keeps them up at night. I will say mm -hmm. that interviewing requires a lot, a lot of preparation. You know, if someone's written books and I'm going to pretty much read maybe all their books or a lot of their books, uh, listen to them online, try to get a sense of repeated things that repeated issues that keep up coming up for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I know not everyone loves doing interviews. I, I love it. I just love it. That's really in, important. I think to hear as someone who's doing interviews now, because you have this wealth of experience. So I am really internalizing all of what you just said. I'd like to say one more thing about that. Yeah. It's really important in an interview to ask questions that they're not getting in other in other formats. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've interviewed David Brooks several times and he once said to me after an interview, no one has ever asked me these questions. Mm -hmm. And he said it in a little frustrated way, but then with a smile. And I felt like that, that was a success. Um, and I think for me, interviewing people and thinking about the Jewish dimension of their work and what inspires them or what they struggle with 
when they're really speaking in a world platform, whether it's about politics or literature or you or, or other trends, and trying to get a different story, and I think uh, I think people respond to that because they have pat answers to the questions that everybody has asked them before. Mm. The key is to ask them things that they they're not anticipating, and then you get answers that are surprising. That must be such an interesting, I mean, I guess I'm saying must be, but I'm, that's, I guess, what I'm trying to do here too. Um, but that's a really interesting, I think, way. The, the main word that pops out at me from what you just said is curiosity, because something I can definitely echo. You know, there are these incredible people, and they almost seem like there's a degree of distance between, like, the public figures and the people who you have a conversation with. And it's a really interesting experience to sit down with someone who— you've read their work, you've read about them, um, and now they're a person in front of you. Um, and that's a very, I think, different way of looking at someone. I think part of the challenge, Julia, is shrinking the distance. Yeah. Because if you see that person and you're an adoration of that person, you're not, I think, going to ask really great questions. Um, mm-hmm. When I had the um, the gift of interviewing um, Secretary Albright, mm-hmm. I actually bought her a pin I bought her a Sterling typewriter. She she loves pins. And I actually, mm-hmm. in Phoenix, Arizona, I went to an exhibit of her pins that she wore in different contexts to make political statements. And so I felt like I try to do something which equalizes the space between us somewhat, mm-hmm. um, because otherwise it's not going to feel like a real conversation. It's going to feel very stilted. Yeah. And what are some of the impactful stories that you've heard from these people? Because you'd mentioned wanting to hear things that aren't being told elsewhere. What are some examples of things that have really just impacted you and your experience? Well, actually, I'll, I'll talk about the, the Albright interview. It was interesting. Um, I think it was, I, I can't remember which book it was for the moment. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, she writes, she writes big books. So if you're interviewing her, it's going to be, there's a lot of prep time. And, mm-hmm. um, and I was, I, I, I confess to being starstruck. Um, it was, I think yeah. it was at a local, uh, JCC in the Washington area. And, um, I said to her, this was, this was shortly after the revelation that she had had Jewish parents. And mm-hmm. although she does, she wasn't a practicing Jew. And I said, um, secretary Albright backstage, I said, someone is going to ask you a question about your Jewish identity. Do you want it to come from the audience or do you want it to come from me? Mm-hmm. My preference would be for me because then we can control it a little bit more. And she said, okay, that's good. You'll ask me. And I asked her a question of how she deals with this. And of course, the first question from the audience in the Q&A was the same question, which mm-hmm. meant either they weren't listening or what I took from that is there's a huge anxiety around Jewish identity and people want to know, what do you mean you weren't Jewish? What do you mean you didn't know? And um, and we're, we, we easily attack um, I'll give you an example I, because I speak publicly myself so often. Um, afterwards, it'd be common in in-person experiences for someone to come up to me and the first thing they say is, here's what you didn't say. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a certain, um, it puts everybody on the defensive. It's, it doesn't create warmth. Um, my, in my interviews, there's never a gotcha moment. That's not what I'm interested in. And I, I don't think it creates a safe space for people to make themselves open and vulnerable and Mm -hmm. share. Uh, I think if you watch some fantastic interviewers, you know, you'll watch the way that they try to insinuate themselves, even with enemies, right. To try to get something that someone else doesn't get. Everyone is preparing to be on the defensive. And I don't, I don't, I don't find that to be a pleasant experience. I don't, I don't think it yields something that's meaningful. Having the opportunity to speak to I think Madeleine Albright being a really great example of this, but you talk a lot about Jewish identity, but I think there's a very particular experience of Jewish identity as a woman, like feminine Jewish identity being this doubly complicated thing to grapple with. How has that been having the opportunity? You know, you think of Madeleine Albright as someone that you look up to as a little girl. Um, And just to be able to, to equalize that space, to understand that your words and the story that you're sharing will be something that a young person, a young woman will be inspired by. How has that been for you to kind of grapple with? Yeah. In that specific interview, someone had asked her, you know, you have a PhD and you've been a secretary of state and other political positions and you raised uh, three girls and how did you do it? And she just said, you can do it all. You just can't do it all at the same time. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, that was, I think, very important 
lesson, even though I already had four children at that point and I had my own PhD. Um, but I thought she said it in such a concise and impactful way and allowed women to sort of put down the burden of having to be everything at all times. Mm -hmm. Um, generally, maybe this isn't what you're going to want to hear. I don't see myself as a female on stage. Mm -hmm. I, I, those in some way, those categories feel quite binary to me because it's saying as a woman, is there a certain way you approach something as opposed to as a human being, is there a way that you approach things? And so I'm not looking for them to give an answer as a woman. Um, I'm, and, and actually I have to say, I sort of get to moments where I resent that. Mm -hmm. Um, I was once on a panel in front of several hundred people and the, the question that the moderator asked me as opposed to asking others in the panel was my experience of being a Jewish woman. Mm -hmm. And I said, maybe not so nicely. I said, I'm happy to talk to you about adult education and I'm happy to talk to you about Jewish identity. And it was a list of things, but why do, why am I the one who always has to have to answer the woman question? Mm -hmm. And now that doesn't mean I'm trying to deny my own femininity or the fact that I am female and the fact that motherhood has been a great blessing in my life. And now being a grandmother, um, I, I just, I just, I feel like it can't be always on the table because it sets us back a little bit. And it was, it, we don't, we're not, we're not speaking as humans. We're, we're now in a, in a box and in the box, I'm going to let you out of the box a little bit or let you speak from the box. Does that make sense? That makes absolute sense. I've had similar experiences where I was asked to do a speaking um, piece and I was told explicitly that you're the woman who's going to be representing the, the female community in this, this panel, this whatever it is at the time. And I always really resent that. And I'm really, really curious because you mentioned that you don't see yourself as a female on stage. It's something I think that I can actually understand really well. Do you see yourself as Jewish on stage too? Does that label feel like something you're owning in that moment? Or do you feel like you're just another person with whoever it is that you're interviewing? No, no. And it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. I've never been asked that. There you go. Um, (laughs) uh, I, I actually always see myself as Jewish wherever I am. So it's interesting that level of identity in some ways, so I can't even say close to the skin, it is the skin. Mm -hmm. Um, And in fact, I think that that's one of the reasons that I'm doing an interview is we're in a Jewish setting, or we're trying to elicit some kind of Jewish connection to a a speaker or or a situation. I think that's also a product of the fact that I I study texts every day, I write about texts every day. I'm in a world, in a deeply ancient Jewish world, mm-hmm. and walking as a modern person. So there's always sort of a drumbeat of, or a connection, you know, synthesizing a connection. Oh, I read something about that, or I studied that, or here's a verse in the Bible, or here's a piece of Talmud. And so that is a language that I walk in. And those are synapses that are constantly going for me. Um, and I think, as you said, uh, wisely, you know, when you, when you're asked to do something simply by virtue of being a woman, what they're saying is uh, you're not here for your brain, your ideas, you're here for your anatomy and people don't even realize how insulting it is. And so I think, yeah. I think I probably naturally have some backlash to that. Um, maybe when I'm older and wiser, I'll feel more at peace with that and more, you know, more willing to say, I'll, I'll do the women only sort of, you know, talking, thinking, studying, but for right now it's, It's bipartisan and transgender has that. No, I I really understand that resentment to it. That's something that I've felt a lot growing up as well. You know, I I was raised never really being aware of the fact that it was different because I was a woman or anything was different because I was a woman. It's become, I think, a bit more prevalent in my life as I've gotten older. Um, But I've always really resented that and want to be successful as a person. Um, And I'm really curious why there is that difference that being a Jew is this transcending thing, even though being a woman sometimes is something we can put on the back burner. And I'm curious why. I'm curious. I think it's really interesting because you mentioned that growing up, your experience with Judaism has shifted so much when maybe your experience with womanhood has remained constant. Um, Like, what do you think that connection comes from? Um, that is, that is very, that is very hard to say. I Mm -hmm. I will say, you know, when I, 
I went to a fancy prep school from ninth and 10th mm-hmm. grade. And then as I was becoming more observant and, um, and, and Sabbath observant, I, uh, there was a policy in my school that, um, I, I had a merit scholarship to go to that school. And if you took off for, you know, private reasons, one of them being religious observance, you would lose your merit scholarship. Really? And I, yeah. And I, my, my family at that time was not able to afford the expensive tuition. By the time I was in 10th grade, I didn't want to go to school in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I gave up my scholarship and I got on a train to the New York area by myself and tried to find a school to go to. And it was a very lonely experience. And I also had given up a lot. You know, it was, mm-hmm. a, it was, I loved school. It was, you know, I, 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 I loved being there. It wasn't that I didn't like the school. It was that I wanted something else for my life. So you'll see where this is going, Julia. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I got to the Fresh Yeshiva, which is where I spent my junior and senior years, even though I had to take classes with freshmen in Jewish studies, because I just, and they knew way more than I ever knew. Um, but I felt this deep sense of home. And we were learning Talmud in co-ed settings. And Yentl, the movie Yentl came out my last year. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, you know, we'd finished our APs and we went to the Cineplex that was not far from school. And we watched, a bunch of us watched Yentl together. And my reaction was, it's such a shame she didn't go to Frisch. And it was, I didn't have any <laughs> sense of the limitations that were placed on me because no one had said to me, this is not for you. Yeah. Um, when I went on to study in Israel for two years and then, uh, and then in university, in Yeshiva University, my Talmud class was very, very small my sense that the world had narrowed and that the possibilities had narrowed was hard because part of me felt like Judaism transcends this. You know, scholarship has gone through so many different years and so many iterations. And I think that what saves me is always the notion of commentary. What's mm-hmm. a commentary? A commentary says, here, read something and read other people's voices on that thing, right? see what they say. And so a 12th century Southern French commentary is going to be different than a 16th century Italian is going to be different than a psychologist who lives in the 20th century, Mm. who also may read something from the Bible. And because of the power of commentary, I understood that I could maybe have a very small voice, not a big voice, but a very small voice and jump into that conversation. And that's very different than the, the feeling I got about uh, about a lot of women's issues, which was, mm-hmm. you don't belong here, or the door is closed, or we can't even begin this conversation. And it's always a fight. I never felt with my Jewish learning, it was a fight. I always felt it was an invitation. And I think, I think we gravitate towards things that invite us and welcome us. And I think we move away from the doors that are closed. Now, there are many, many powerful women who opened doors before for the two of us so that we could have this conversation Absolutely. and they were knocking on the door and they were banging it down. And they, and I think there's an, a lot of that. And I think I've done some of that, maybe mm-hmm. a little choir fashion, but I think we've all had to do that. And the generations after us don't always appreciate that. But I would say, if you said, Erica, do you want to fight or do you want to love? I'm always going to go with love. And I think I think good invitations, I think there have been people in my life, scholars, teachers, who never said to me, this is closed for you. I, I had the mm. um, the amazing opportunity of studying with some remarkable teachers. Um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs uh, oh, wow. of, of Blessed Memory, who died this past year, was my thesis advisor for my master's. I lived in London at the time. Um, Professor Isidore Torsky, the Tonle Rebbe at Harvard. These were people who never, ever said to me, you're one, you can't be here. It was like, open the book and read. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think that's our job is to say, is to open the books and open the conversations for other people and say, I want to hear what you have to say. It's so interesting because on one hand, you'd think there'd be this tension. You are studying the Talmud, the, one of the most ancient pieces of literature that you could be studying. And you're doing it in a really modern context. You're having a really modern perspective on this indefinite equality. And it, it makes sense that you're the reason why these two things aren't in contention, why they aren't in conflict with one another, is because you're viewing them through a Jewish way. 
And I think that's a really radically modern way of thinking about it, almost inadvertently. Is that conscious, is that on purpose, or is that kind of how it's manifested throughout your experiences? Yeah, it hasn't been inadvertent. I mean, it hasn't been accidental. I think mm-hmm. it's been very intentional. I think I think people who really respect the process of learning open up the world and they see beyond. They don't see the color of your skin, your gender, your age. They they just sort of reflect on your ideas. And I understand, Julia, we can't take ideas away. Ideas are embodied in people. Um, but, you know, I, I had the the good fortune of completing uh, a cycle of Talmud, of Daf Yomi, of daily study. It took seven and a half years. And I got to speak in Jerusalem at the Sium at the conclusion of that. Now, in my wildest dreams, Julia, could I imagine standing up on a podium with thousands of other women? Thousands. I just, it was, it was a dream. I was like literally pinching myself. It was like, I don't know, winning the World Cup or I don't know, the Super Bowl. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I was just so awed. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about those small Talmud classes or, or experiences where people did try to close a book or did try to close an opportunity. And I just felt like, wow, this room is on fire and how grateful I am to live now. And I hope I, I'm grateful to the people who came before me who allowed this to happen um, many of the men who were teachers and mentors who saw beyond and allowed this to happen. And so our job is to really continue to open those doors and, and create possibilities that we never, realities that we couldn't have imagined uh, at an earlier time. That's so impactful to hear that experience of standing in front of thousands of women just talk. I mean, just hearing this story, it, it makes me like react. So I can't imagine living it. Um, and I guess that really brings us to our last question, which you've talked about a little bit already, but what we want this podcast to be is we're in this modern world, we're studying this ancient tradition, um, and we want to give everyone, but mainly young women, access to mentors they probably will never get the chance to meet, to kind of do what you said and squish that space between the people that you read about and the people that you're meeting. Um, and what's one piece of advice that you'd want to give to the people listening to this, specifically to young girls? about navigating the world as a Jewish woman, especially within the framing that you've, you've spoken about already? Yeah. People respect ideas. Be one of those people who has them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to say a few things that aren't so popular. Mm-hmm. I think the American Jewish community is not saturated with lots of content. Mm-hmm. I think the conversation is quite shallow. There are a lot of Jewish cliches. There's not enough ideas. Um, there, there's not enough respect for ancient traditions and how they impact modern lives. And people need them. We are meaning makers and we search for meaning. Mm-hmm. And Judaism has a lot of meaning. But you also have to study to, to gain access. And the more informed and um, the more informed and thoughtful you are, the more people want to hear what you have to say. That takes work. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we're also a very suburban community in the sense that what we talk about tends to be what we own and what we want, right, as, you know, material things. Um, and America has been a place of great abundance for the, for the Jewish community. And there's another side of this, which is that doesn't make you an interesting person. Mm-hmm. I'm interested in interesting people. I think that's the gift of interviewing is to interview interesting people. I think everyone has the capacity to be an interesting person. Mm. You have to ask yourself, am I an interesting person? Am I reading or am I sort of mindlessly scrolling? What does it take to be an interesting person? Um, Who do I need to meet? What conversations do I have to have? All this doesn't have to be intellectual. But I think think that question for me, it's not only about women. It's really about humanity right now. Are you an interesting person? Are you someone someone would want to interview because you have something worthwhile to say? And... um, And I'm not suggesting that ideas alone make someone worthwhile. We are all worthwhile by virtue of being God's creations. What do we do with the fact that we're created? Do we create an imitation of God? Are we occupied with the work of creation, of bringing new ideas, of bringing people together who've never been together before? Am I allowed to give another piece of advice? Absolutely. The more the merrier. (laughs) (laughs) Women 
and girls need to create stronger sisterhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, I think girls are toxic to each other. I'm someone who suffered at the, at the toxicity mm-hmm. and the drama of, of girls who just, you know, make fun and belittle. Mm-hmm. And I've watched that have its own adult version and it's really not pleasant. Mm-hmm. At a certain point, you're not in sixth grade anymore. And, and, and you need to take some responsibility for the female communities that you create. Mm-hmm. And I say that because sometimes women like to be, they, they take advantage of the fact that they're still a minority in certain settings and they want to be sort of special and unique and they don't reach out and mentor younger women. Yeah. And they, and they're jealous and competitive of women who are at their same stage. Put it down, put it down. It's too much to carry. And it's not, it's not pleasant. We can lift each other up and lift up ideas and lift up the world when we do that together. And that's not something I hear enough of. I hear a lot about sort of promoting female leaders and um, and not sort of promoting a, a collective of compassion and leadership and concern and morality. We're here to do that work together. And it's everything is more fun and everything is more meaningful when we can do it as a community. That's really wonderful advice. And um, you are a huge part of that by being this person who is both a leader and a mentor for so many people, so many students. And it's been such an honor to speak with you today. I feel like I've learned a lot from this conversation. I'm sure everyone listening can echo that sentiment. And thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I can't think of a better way to spend time, Julia. And uh, it's really, it's been an honor to be with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. There was something about this episode that just felt so different for me. When I started this project with the Unpacked team, our vision was to create a podcast that was almost an archive of sorts. An archive of history being made today and of the women who are making it. I believe without question that the future of the Jewish world, the future of the world in general, is female. Our power and our commitment to bettering the world is palpable. And we finally have all of the resources to achieve this chance. This conversation with Dr. Brown reminded me of why we started this podcast in the first place. Sitting down with her, I kept forgetting that we were in an interview. For just this moment, she really embodied the purpose of this project, mentorship. The advice she gave was the advice I felt like I, beginning my career now, needed to hear. For Dr. Brown, womanhood is a piece of her life, not a lens through which she views the world. Judaism, on the other hand, is different. Judaism shifts the way she thinks so strongly that it's impossible to separate it from herself. There's something about that that I really connected to. Growing up in the early 2000s, my parents taught me to be a strong person, a smart person, a successful person. It wasn't until I got older and began to confront the way sexism shapes our world that I realized how most people view us as strong women, as smart women, as successful women. But Dr. Brown is so much more than a nice Jewish girl. Dr. Brown is a complete person. She's a person before she's a woman even, but she's a Jew before she's a person. And honestly, I'm still grappling with the significance of that statement. I probably will be for quite some time. I have no choice but to ask myself now, who am I? And this, my friends, is where we'll leave you for today's episode of Nice Jewish Girls. Hopefully a bit smarter and a bit more inspired. I would love, 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 as usual, to hear your feedback and suggestions for other nice Jewish girls to host on this pod. Email us at podcasts at jewishunpacked.com and join us next week when we'll be speaking with Danny Goldblatt, esteemed Jewish studies teacher, but also famous barbecue chef who makes kosher food. Nice Jewish Girls, the production of Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Rivki Stern is our producer, and I am your host, Julia Jassy. Check out jewishunpacked.com for everything Unpacked related, and subscribe to our other podcasts. I want to give a quick shout out to a weekly podcast you might love, called This Week Unpacked. In 15-minute episodes, my colleagues Avi and Sarah explore a relevant and important topic in Jewish and Israel news. Check it out and let me know what you think. And follow Unpacked at all of the social media places, like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Just look for at Jewish Unpacked. Talk to you later, ladies.